The ocean is a big place. To call it vast undersells it dramatically. When a ship vanishes over the horizon, we can thankfully track them with modern technology. But back in the past centuries, when a ship vanished over that horizon, they might as well have been in limbo until they reappeared in port. Because in the days before communication, anything could happen while they were isolated out on the waves. And while many ships did return safely, there were many which simply vanished without a trace as well. Today, we are going to sail out into that blue void that is the ocean and dig up some of its mysteries from its murky depths. Starting off, we have probably the most famous of the missing ships that we'll be covering today, and my personal favorite of them. The Collins Line owned SS Pacific, First, let's talk quickly about the history of the ship, and then about her mysterious fate. The SS Pacific was one of four sister ships, the others being the Atlantic, the Arctic, and the Baltic. For their day, the mid-19th century, these four ships were the fastest, largest, and most well-appointed transatlantic steamers on the ocean. In fact, the SS Pacific held, held the Blue Ribband for 11 months from 1850 to 1851. These four liners excelled in luxury, and the Pacific could hold 200 first-class passengers within her accommodations. Passengers could enjoy steam heating in their berths, a barber shop, and meals made by a French chef. A liner at this time wouldn't have had electric lights. Rather, I imagine she was probably illuminated by oil lamps. Pacific also had high freeboard and straight stems, which also contributed to passenger comfort by providing added protection from the ocean spray while out on deck. The Pacific was 281 feet long and her hull was built from yellow pine, white oak, and chestnut. The four sisters were designed by New York marine architect George Steers. The colors each ship was painted in were that of the Collins line, a black hull with a dark red stripe running along the length of the ship. The four sisters existed at a time when ships were in a bit of a hybrid point, you could say. Transitioning from sail power to steam power, Pacific had sails, but her primary means of motion were her side paddle wheels. As you can see in the painting, Pacific had masts for sails and a single smokestack. Pacific was launched in 1849, and her maiden voyage occurred a little under a year and a half later in May 1850. The ship's running gear was designed in such a way that if one engine failed, the remaining engine could continue to supply power to both paddle wheels. The steam which powered the paddle wheels were supplied by four vertical tubular boilers with a double row of furnaces designed by the line's chief engineer, John Farron. The Pacific consumed as much as 85 short tons of coal per day to power herself across the high seas of the North Atlantic Ocean. The sails on her three fully rigged masts merely served as auxiliary power. Back then, engine failures were very common, a fact we touched on in the deep dive video about the disappearance of the SS Wartop. The reason these four ships were built in the first place is because in 1847, Congress granted a large subsidy to the New York and Liverpool United States Mail Steamship Company for the establishment of an American-based service to compete with the British Cunard Line in the transatlantic market. The Collins Line was the winner of these pitches, and the four sisters followed shortly afterwards. Pacific retained a New York to Liverpool route for her entire career. Now, on to her loss. On January 23, 1856, the Pacific departed Liverpool for New York. She was only carrying 45 passengers, typical for an off-season winter crossing. She was also carrying 141 crew. And that's it. She was never seen again, and she was one of many ships which vanished in the North Atlantic Ocean around that time of that year. Many others vanished that year due to icebergs being unusually bad. Pacific's commander on the last voyage was Captain A. Elderidge, a seasoned captain, who was known for being daring, but a very capable seaman. Elderidge had commanded three ships before taking on the Pacific, and he still holds the record for the highest transatlantic crossing by commercial sailing vessel to this day. After Pacific failed to reach her destination, other ships searched for her, but nothing was ever found. 
save for a possible small debris field, but this is dubious to, again, the amount of ships which disappeared around this time in the same general area on the same general route. The only real clue we've ever gotten came in the form of a small bottle which washed ashore on an isolated island on the west coast of Scotland in 1861, which read, On board the Pacific from Liverpool to New York, ship going down, confusion on board, icebergs around us on every side. I know I cannot escape. I write the cause of our loss that friends may not live in suspense. The finder will please get it published. It was signed by a W.M. Graham and upon checking the passenger list, that name did appear on Pacific's last passenger manifest. A British captain who was traveling to New York to take command of his own ship. This note led to it being declared in 1861 that the Pacific was lost due to striking an iceberg. How could this happen, though? Well, the Collins Line ships had to not only keep their crossings at a consistent time frame due to a strict requirement as part of their deal, with the earlier mentioned post service, but they were also advertised uh, based on their speed. When a new Cunard line ships were being built, which were advertised to be faster, it all likely combined to urge the crew of the Pacific to push her to the absolute limits, to stay not only on schedule, but also ahead, literally, of their following competition. It is likely almost certain, in fact, that the Pacific was sailing at full speed and straight into waters filled heavily with icebergs. I imagine the Pacific steaming full steam ahead, determined to beat the new Cunard Line ship, which was advertised to be faster than her, and in the dead of night, while deep in an iceberg field, she had a head-on crash or a sideswipe collision with an iceberg. You can imagine a scenario where the crew saw one ahead, swung the ship around the berg, and then crashed into one right behind it that they couldn't see. You can imagine all sorts of ways that the collision might have occurred. Pacific sister ship, the Arctic, took four hours to sink, so perhaps the Pacific took a similar amount of time. There would have been time for the damage to be assessed, and for the passengers to realize something was wrong. If the note in the bottle is authentic, you can imagine how the events might have played out. Perhaps it is a bit of a romantic notion, but I imagine the writer of this note, who was a captain of a vessel himself, as I mentioned, again, he was traveling on Pacific so he could take command of his own ship, having realized that the ship was foundering, sitting alone at a bar within the vessel and writing this message for us as the water creeps higher and higher up the deck and as passengers rush for her stern or jump into the frigid sea, before placing his note into the bottle and throwing it off the side of the ship, before waiting for the end with everyone else. Who knows? This story does make your mind wander about the acts people partook in those final minutes. This story was long before wireless technology would appear on ships, so there would have been no way to call for help, and the passengers would have known it. Either way, the wreck has never been found. It probably won't be, as it has likely all but rotted away by now, and that single bottle was the only clue we have to this day. We don't know for sure if it was authentic, but most agree it likely is since it was signed by a passenger on of the ship. For a hoaxer to fake it, they would have really had to do their homework. Back then, fake messages and bottles were almost always signed by names which didn't appear on passenger lists, which is something we will see in the next story. Perhaps enough of the Pacific remains that one day, if she is found by chance, we can determine what sent her and her passengers to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. We'll never know the ultimate fate Pacific countered, or when and where, but somewhere on that fateful voyage, something caused her to slip beneath the waves of the Atlantic and vanish forever. Pacific's loss was nearly the final nail on the coffin for the struggling Collins line. They continued on for a few more years, but ultimately they were bankrupted and their vessels, including two of Pacific's sister ships, were sold to other hands. Out of the four sisters, the SS Baltic was the most successful. While two of the four were lost to the sea, she outlasted her builder's company and remained in service until near the end of the 19th century, when she was eventually retired and scrapped. A true shame, as seeing one of these liners today would be truly incredible. While the RMS Titanic is, most definitely, 
White Star Line's most infamous of their many lost ships, this one is also a story worth talking about. Occurring just over 20 years before the sinking of the Titanic in April 1912, the SS Neuronic was mysteriously lost in February 1893. Neuronic was a cargo ship, specifically tasked with taking goods from Britain to America and then taking American cattle back on the return trip. The cattle had very comfortable accommodations to ensure that they survived the crossing in good health. And Neuronic could also carry within her passengers as well, as she was equipped with cabins and accommodations for them. Like many other ships we've talked about, such as the SS Pacific and the SS Wartel, SS Neuronic had no wireless set to call for help with, which meant that, like those ships, whatever difficulty they encountered they had to face without help as it was impossible to send out a distress call. Marconi Wireless, the company whose set Titanic would use to call for help with, would not open for five years yet as of the time that Neuronic would disappear. At this time, the only way a ship could hope for help in a situation of distress was if another ship happened to pass by. With how big the ocean was, this would require a lot of luck, to put it lightly. So, after only a brief career, Neuronic left Liverpool for New York on the 11th of February, 1893. She had 60 crew members on board, including several officers and mechanics. She also was carrying 14 passengers on this crossing. There were no cattle on this crossing, remember those would be loaded in America and then sent back to England on the return voyage, though she did have a few horses on board, along with some cages of live pigeons and chickens. Neuronic was also carrying enough coal for the round trip. After leaving Liverpool, Neuronic made a brief stop in North Wales to put her harbor pilot ashore, and then she headed off into the Atlantic for her crossing, straight into rough seas from which she would never be seen again. So what happened? For the time, Neuronic was a very modern ship. She even had watertight doors and compartments. Her crossing was expected to take 10 days, but when she didn't arrive, no one was worried. As I mentioned in the Waratah video, at the time it was common for ships to be weeks overdue, so not arriving as scheduled was no cause for concern. Bad weather, such as strong winds, were slowing down several ships at the same time, so everyone assumed Neuronic was in the same boat, no pun intended. After several weeks was when people began to grow concerned for Neuronic's safety, and the safety of those on board her. White Star Line stood behind the quality of their ship and said the following, according to a journalist. They, White Star, think she's afloat and have every reason to hope she's safe. They stress that the ship is recent, built with watertight compartments, well-equipped, handled, and commanded by the best officers in the Atlantic. This attitude quickly changed, and on March 13, just over a month after Neuronic left Liverpool, White Star Line said, there is now great concern about the ship. After searches turned up nothing, White Star then said the following statement about the fate of Neuronic. We still hope that it can be safe, but it is unlikely that it will be found. Because the Atlantic is crisscrossed by steamers and sailboats, and it would certainly have been spotted if it had still been afloat. To this day, SS Neuronic has never been found. Though the ocean did spit out some clues, on March 19th, it was reported that a British steamer had sighted two of Neuronic's empty lifeboats, 500 miles east of Halifax, Nova Scotia. The first of the two boats were capsized, and the second was swamped. Like with the SS Pacific, a few bottled messages washed up on both sides of that little pond called the Atlantic. But unlike in the case of the Pacific, these are not believed to be authentic messages from the crew of the Neuronic. One of these bottle messages said the following, 3.10 a.m., February 19, SS Neuronic at sea. To who picks this up? Report when you find this to our agent, if not heard of before, that our ship is sinking fast beneath the waves. It's such a storm that we can never live in the small boats. One boat is already gone with our human cargo below. God let us all live through this. We were struck by an iceberg in a blinding snowstorm and floated two hours. Now, it is 3.20 a.m. by my watch, and the great ship is dead level with the sea. Report to the agents at Broadway, New York, M. Kersey and Company. Goodbye, all. 
The message was signed by John Olson, cattleman, but there was no John Olson on the ship's manifest. The closest names on the manifest which matched were John O'Hara and John Watson. Some theories put forth to explain the disappearance of the Neuronic include that she was capsized after being caught in a large wave in a storm. However, Neuronic's earlier captain, who was rotated off-ship by the voyage she vanished on, said that the ship had never been unsteady. Some of the other messages and bottles which washed up indicated that the ship had struck an iceberg somewhere south of Newfoundland. However, this was disputed because Neuronic's planned route took her 100 miles south of where ice had been seen. However, this was also disputed as well because other ships did report ice in that area. The same area Titanic sank in 19 years later. Ultimately, we'll likely never know the fate that befell Neuronic unless her wreck is found, but since we have no idea where to look, the odds of finding her resting place are all but zero. What do you think happened to the Neuronic? Let me know in a comment. Jumping back in time to 1837, let's cover one story that, while sensational at the time, has become rather obscure today. This story was one of the great maritime mysteries of the 19th century. It has probably been the subject of more speculation than any other 19th century ocean mystery, second, of course, to the Mary Celeste, which is probably the most famous unsolved ocean mystery of all time. The Madagascar was built at the Blackwall Yard in London, a shipyard co-owned by the Wingram family. She was a Blackwall frigate, a name for a type of three-masted full-rigged ship built between the late 1830s and the 1870s. The first of these frigates were designed and built by Wingram and Green at the Blackwall Yard. So the Madagascar had a 16-year career, during which she was proudly helmed by her first master, William H. Walker, one of her co-owners, under the command of Captain F. William Harris, the Madagascar left port at Plymouth on the 11th of March, 1853, and she reached her destination of Melbourne, Australia, after an uneventful 87-day voyage. Fourteen of her crew jumped ship at Melbourne, and three were hired on as replacements. After arriving at Melbourne, she was loaded up with a cargo consisting of wool, rice, and about two tons of gold valued at 240,000 pounds. Surprised no one has dedicated their lives trying to find her just for that. Those treasure hunters from Independence Day Resurgence probably would, to be honest with you, since they didn't let, you know, an alien ship as big as the Earth itself scare them off. While at Melbourne, the Madagascar took on 110 passengers bound for London. Then... On Wednesday, August 11, 1853, the Madagascar was preparing to sail when police suddenly boarded her and arrested a bush ranger named John Francis, who had robbed the Melbourne private escort between a gold field and Kington on July 20th. If only that was the most exciting thing for the passengers to tell their families in London about. Unfortunately, they wouldn't get the chance. The arrests delayed the Madagascar until August 12, 1853, when she was finally able to set off for port, heading back for London. The Madagascar was never seen again. We have no idea what happened to her, but some of the theories that went around after she never arrived included her striking an iceberg, her wool cargo spontaneously combusting, or her being seized by criminal elements among the passengers or crew and then scuttled with the gold being stolen and the remaining passengers and crew murdered. Just like with the South American in my video about ships which vanished on the Great Lakes, somewhere on her voyage from Australia to London, the Madagascar was swallowed whole by the ocean and will likely never be found. If her wood hull is even still intact or recognizable, in all likelihood, all that remains on the ocean floor by now are some of the more durable artifacts, which wouldn't rot away on the bottom of the ocean, and of course her cargo of gold. 
where these artifacts might be, though, is anyone's guess. You gotta wonder, if those arrests hadn't delayed her, would she have arrived at her destination safely? Who knows? We can only wonder. Let's conclude with a much more modern mystery, the disappearance of the MS Munchen. She was a German lash carrier that sank with all hands for unknown reasons in the North Atlantic storm in December 1978. However, experts agree that it is likely that the MS Munchen was likely struck by one or more rogue waves. But let's cover a little bit of history real quick before we cover her fate. A fate which is nightmarish, by the way. She was launched on May 12, 1972, and departed on her maiden voyage to the United States on October 19, 1972, having entered service on September 22nd of the same year when she was delivered. The cargo ship was designed to carry barges, or lighters, which in turn would carry other cargo aboard them. Lash, or Lighter aboard ship systems refer to the practice of loading barges on board bigger vessels for transport. These types of ships are known also as kangaroo ships. I didn't have a specific reason to include that. I just thought it was kind of funny. Munchen was designed to be very safe and able to brave the treacherous North Atlantic Ocean when it was at its worst taking some of the lessons learned from centuries of lost ships that we've covered in this video to heart, and some thought that she was unsinkable. Man, once again, we've got to stop calling ships that. Back to Mugen's disappearance, the last time she departed port was on December 7th, 1978, bound for Savannah, Georgia. It, it was her usual route and the cargo she carried on this voyage consisted of steel products, which were stored in 83 lighters. These are a type of flat-bottom barge used for transporting goods, and she had a crew of 28 on this, ultimately, final voyage. The voyage was going smoothly, and as expected, until December 11 and December 12. Her radio operator was overheard at this time on a shortwave chat frequency that the ship was experiencing some bad weather. Mukin's last known position was reported by her radio operator as being 44 degrees north, 24 degrees west. Three hours later, Mukin's operator began sending out SOS's, desperate pleas for help. The messages were transmitted in Morse code, and only parts of them were received, but one of those fragments paints a chilling picture. It said simply, 50 degrees. What does 50 degrees mean, you ask? Well, the most accepted theory is that the ship was rolled by one or more rogue waves and was damaged to the point that she was drifting with a 50 degree list onto her starboard side. Automatic emergency signals were also received by multiple radio stations starting at close to 5 a.m., but nothing further was heard or reported shortly after 7.30. Further weak, fragmentary communications were heard from the vessel on December 13th, by this time, search efforts were underway. These final, desperate calls for help mentioned 28 people being on board the vessel sending them, which is what has led many to conclude that these were messages from the Mucan. Remember, her crew on this voyage was 28 people. A few lifeboats were recovered, along with a yellow barrel being sighted. When the weather finally cleared on December 14th, the search was intensified, with 17 ships assisting in the search for the Mucan. Mucan's emergency buoy was salvaged on December 17th at 1 p.m. Three life vests were also sighted. Some of her barges were also found, and a week after it began, the international search ep operation officially ended in the evening on December 20th. And that's it. The last object discovered from Mucan was her damaged starboard side lifeboat. Today, our best guess is that she was struck by a massive rogue wave, or maybe several of them, and drifted for days, listing almost all the way onto her side, before ultimately sinking in an unknown location somewhere in the North Atlantic Ocean. Quietly swallowed up by the waves before anyone could find her, as if she'd never even been there. She has never been found. She rests somewhere on the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean with so many other ships. 
The damage on the one recovered lifeboat is what leads experts today to believe that she was struck by rogue waves. Mukin's legacy is that final, eerie SOS call. 50 degrees. Because this ship has such a short story to go with it, I thought why not include it as a quick little bonus story at the end here. The F.V. Jutland. I wasn't originally going to include this story, but I just happened upon it and thought it was worth sharing. And it's on topic, and it's also so short. Seriously, the Wikipedia page is, I think, shorter than the one about the Door Point Volcano from a few videos ago. So it just makes a good bonus story to end off with. So, the FV Jutland was a Canadian beam trawler. She was based out of Liverpool, Nova Scotia. Not the other one, mind you. And was built in 1918. She was owned by the Le Havre Fishing Company. We're already like halfway through all the information on Wikipedia about her, by the way. In March of 1920, the FV Jutland left for her fishing grounds off the Western Bank with her crew of 21. And that's it. Some pieces of her were found full of water later on by some other ships. The body of her mate, John R. Ellison, was discovered in one of these flooded debris which were both dories, which are small, shallow draft boats up to 23 feet long. These two dories from the F.V. Jutland were found 86 nautical miles southeast of Halifax. No bodies from any other crew members were ever found, and we have no idea what happened to the F.V. Jutland. Theories range from a collision of some kind to even an explosion. To date, her status remains missing as of March 10, 1920. We'll probably never know her fate either. So if you've been around my channel for a minute, you should recognize this name. I talked about this ship briefly in my video about the HMS Eurydice. Like I said in that video, this ship had several names. HMS Mariner, HMS Atalanta, and HMS Juno. She was a 26-gun Spartan-class six-rate frigate for the Royal Navy, and she was laid down in April 1842 and launched on July 1, 1844. At the time of her disappearance, Juno had been renamed to Atalanta, and if it really is bad luck to rename a ship, then her crew, unfortunately, fell victim to this curse, because in 1880, she disappeared at sea with all hands. Let's go over what we know. Atalanta was serving as a training ship at the time of her disappearance. She was last seen at the Royal Navy Dockyard in Bermuda for Falmouth, England on January 31st, 1880. That's it. She was never seen again. I sound like a broken record at this point because that's basically all that happened in my last video about missing ships too. They just up and vanished off the face of the earth. And due to the lack of any survivors, we don't know what happened to her either. A guess is that she sank in a storm, which we know crossed her route a few weeks after she departed. Her disappearance has been associated with Legends of the Bermuda Triangle, as has another ship we'll be talking about later in the video. And a memorial was put up at St. Anne's Church, Portsmouth, with all the names of the 281 crew who perished in the disaster. The wreck of the Juno, or whatever you want to call her by, has never been found, but maybe one day someone will happen upon it, and maybe... Just maybe, she can tell us what really happened. Until then, we just have to wonder.
Though it was very prominent back in the day, the Inman Line is not very well remembered today. The Inman Line was a transatlantic service, one of the big ones in the 19th century alongside Cunard Line. One of their ships, the SS City of Paris, even held the coveted Blue Ribband for the fastest crossing of the Atlantic from 1889 to 91 and 1892 to 93. Though the company never reached the historical heights and legacy of their rivals in hindsight. And one of their ships, the topic of the day, was the SS City of Boston. Sailing long before wireless technology would become used on ships, if a ship came into peril, then sometimes a passenger's only hope was that another ship would pass by. And in fact, in 1868, the city of Boston was actually that knight in shining armor for the passengers of the Wahens, or the Wabeno as some sources call her, which had struck an iceberg and was sinking. However, the passengers of the city of Boston in an 1870 crossing of the North Atlantic would not be as lucky as those on the Wahens were. No ship would come in at the last minute to save them. Sailing from Halifax, Nova Scotia for Liverpool, the city of Boston left on January 28, 1870, traveling along her regular New York to Halifax to Liverpool route. She had just shy of 200 people on board during this crossing, several of which were well-known businessmen and high-ranking military personnel. 55 cabin passengers, 52 steerage passengers, and 84 crew. Now on to her loss. After departing for Liverpool, she vanished and was never seen again. No trace has ever been found. A violent gale broke out only a few days after she departed, and this has been seen as a likely cause for her loss. Now, there were messages and bottles which washed ashore. It must have just been the rage back then to do that kind of thing. One of them said the city of Boston had collided with another ship and was sinking. Another message in a bottle claimed that there was a fire on board. None of the names of these matched people who were on the ship, though. An additional note, however, was found on April 19th at Prince's Bay, Staten Island, dated March 2nd. It stated that a fire occurred on the ship, and it was signed with the probable name of one of the steerage passengers. There were many theories at the time outside of the gale causing the ship to sink. Striking an iceberg and sinking was also seen as possible, and suggested. And with the benefit of hindsight of history, we know rogue waves occur in the North Atlantic, and they can topple ships much larger and sturdier than the city of Boston. And of course, a fire on board cannot be ruled out either. Heck, a bomb being placed on the ship was even suggested back in the day. So any of these are possible, but there's one story that I do want to talk about. In 1900, Alicia Thompson, who was a cabin boy on the ship J. G. Norward survived when the ship ran into a severe storm three weeks after leaving port at Galveston, Texas. Everyone by him was washed overboard and he drifted alone at sea for days before becoming entangled in seaweed floating in the Sargasso Sea, which is a region of the, nor of the North Atlantic Ocean bounded by four currents forming an ocean gyre, which is an area where there is a large system of circulating ocean currents, often associated with strong winds. While drifting in this area, Thompson said that he saw the floating wrecks of many ships, one of which was the intact and still floating, but eerily still in silent city of Boston. Thompson eventually escaped the Sargasso Sea by fitting out a lifeboat with a small sail and harnessing the wind. Three weeks later, he was rescued and he wrote his story down. Obviously, the story cannot be verified. Again, I've said it before, but eyewitness testimony is the least reliable form of evidence. But the idea that the ship was drifting abandoned at sea for so long is just cool. I love that kind of stuff. What would he have found on board? I love a good ghost ship story. And obviously, if the ship was somehow still floating and trapped in that region of the ocean in 1900, she's most definitely sunk by now. But if the account is true, then you gotta wonder what happened which led to her drifting abandoned at sea for decades. Today, the city of Boston is not widely remembered, just like the line she belonged to, and this memorial that you see on screen is one of the few which exist to commemorate and remember the loss. This is the one at St. Pancras Parish Church in London, and it bears the name of a family lost in the disaster. Whatever fate befell the city of Boston, it is likely the ocean will keep the secrets it holds so close within its depths from us forever. 
I doubt we'll ever find the wreck or whatever's left of it. All we have to remember the ship by are the drawings showing her in her glory days. I love the look of these hybrid steam-powered and sail-powered ships. They're just neat looking and really only existed in a small window of time as far as ship designs go. They only existed during the transition from sail to steam power. So this ship is very similar looking to the last one, and let's take a moment to talk about the design of the ship. She was also an Inman Line ship, the first one, built by Todd and McGregor of Partick, Glasgow, which was also her port of registry. She was ordered in 1849, christened and launched in February 1850. She was completed in April that year and had her maiden voyage in late April 1850. She had an iron hull and was able to carry 44 first-class passengers and 85 second-class passengers, along with roughly 1,200 tons of cargo within her accommodations. She was also the first Atlantic steamship to carry steerage passengers. Now, if you've seen the first video I did on this topic, you'll remember that the SS Pacific existed around this time, and that she had paddle wheels. Well, she, the city of Glasgow, used a propeller instead. You can see in the picture on the screen that she obviously doesn't have paddle wheels. And this allowed more space for the passengers. City of Glasgow was never built for speed. Her quickest crossing of the Atlantic took 14 days, 4 hours. 4 days longer than the current holder of the fastest crossing at the time. You'll remember that we talked about one of Pacific's issues being that she had to dash across the ocean, even go into iceberg fields at full speed. Well, City of Glasgow did not have that speed problem. She moved at a top speed of 9.5 knots and consumed 20 tons of coal per day. The fastest ship at the time, the Blue Ribbon Holder Asia, consumed 76 tons per day for a little comparison. The city of Glasgow was the first steamship to travel from Glasgow to New York. She was purchased by the Inman Line in October 1850. After entering the immigrant trade in 1852, the city of Glasgow was refitted to hold 400 steers passengers within her hold. Now on to her loss. In March 1854, City of Glasgow left Liverpool with 480 people on board, 111 cabin passengers, 293 steerage, and 76 crew. She was under the command of Captain K. Morrison, his first voyage in command, but not his first voyage as a crew member on the ship, having served as her chief officer prior. She was bound for Philadelphia and due to return on March 25th, 24 days after leaving Liverpool. She was never seen again. City of Manchester, Glasgow's sister ship, encountered several icebergs in her crossing after leaving port on March 8. In fact, many ships said the ice was thicker than it had been in years. And at this time, it was not uncommon for ships to be weeks overdue. A recipe for disaster. At first, her owners assumed ice had delayed her and they weren't worried. The city of Glasgow was well stocked with plenty of water, food, and coal. But by the end of 1854, she was accepted as lost when no new sightings or news of the ship had been reported. Whatever happened, we can only guess. Her fate is not unlike that of the Waratah. Nothing has ever been found. Maybe she struck an iceberg. Maybe she didn't. We'll, we'll never know unless we find her wreck. Since she had an iron hull, there's a chance we could find answers on it if we ever could find her. Now, it's worth noting that a portion of a bow of a ship washed ashore in late October 1854, which bore the name City of Glasgow in gilded letters, but this is seen today as part of another ship which had the same name and was lost earlier that month. No trace of the Inman Line's City of Glasgow has ever been found, and that's not likely to change. Her wreck lies somewhere on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, a silent grave for those who sailed on her during that fateful final voyage. Alright, we're finally out of the 19th century, but we're back in the Bermuda Triangle. So, pick your poison, everyone. This is probably the most famous ship to become associated with the Bermuda Triangle legend, USS Cyclops, the second U.S. ship to bear that name. 
She was a bulk cargo carrier built for the United States before World War I. Her name came from the giants of Greek mythology. She is most remembered today for her loss. She vanished without a trace in 1819 and took all 306 crew and passengers with her. The single greatest loss of life in the history of the United States Navy, which didn't directly involve combat. First though, a little bit of history. Cyclops was launched on the 7th of May, 1910. She had a length of 542 feet and a beam of 65 feet, as well as a draft of 26 feet rounded up. She could move at a speed of 15 knots and entered service in November 1910 with the Navy Auxiliary Service Atlantic Fleet, and she voyaged in the Baltic from May to July 1911 to supply 2nd Division ships. Afterwards, she then operated along the East Coast and down to the Caribbean. During the seven-month-long Battle of Veracruz in 1914, part of the decade-long Mexican Revolution, she called ships on patrol there, and the State Department even expressed their gratitude for the ship and her crew and their part of evacuating refugees. After the United States entered World War I in 1917, Cyclops was commissioned on May 1st of that year. She joined a convoy bound for France in 1917 and returned to the United States safely later that year. Aside from one interruption, she served alongside the east coast of the United States until 1918. Then, she sailed to Brazilian waters to provide fuel for British ships in the South Atlantic. After this, she sailed from Rio de Janeiro on the 16th of February 1918 and entered Salvador two days later on the 20th of February. Two days later, she then departed from Maryland with no scheduled stops along the way and was never seen again, except for a very dubious possible sighting on March 10th. Today, the reason for the loss of the ship is unknown. One explanation is that she might have sunk in a storm. Some thought a German raider or submarine might have sunk her, but the Germans denied ever being involved with her loss. One theory to explain her loss is the manganese ore that she was carrying in her hold. Manganese ore is much denser than coal, and the idea is that it moved around and caused a load shift, which would have made the ship list and become more vulnerable to foundering in bad weather. Another theory involves the ship suffering structural failure, something her sister ship suffered from as well, particularly where the I-beams that ran along the length of the ship were at risk of corroding due to the nature of the cargo she would carry. You know, I brought up the Waratah, but I'll do it again now, because this really reminds me of that. You know, we just don't know. These people just vanished off the face of the earth, and we can only guess why. Maybe one day her wreck will be found, and we'll be able to give us answers. And by the way, as I briefly mentioned, Cyclops had three sister ships. All of them also sank, and two of them also vanished without a trace. Nice. Even though Cyclops is best remembered for her mysterious loss and lack of a known wreck, let's not forget the great deeds and achievements she made during her time in service. Those are incredible acts, and she should be remembered for those. For this last one, we're back in the modern day to show you that ships disappearing is not a phenomena of the past. Though admittedly the reason for this one going down is not very complicated, and unlike the others we do know where the wreck is. This is the story of El Faro. So looking at the screen, you want to take a guess at what sank her? I bet you can't figure it out. So. The El Faro was lost back in 2015, and it's quite the story, so let's get to it. Since this happened in the modern day, we have a whole lot of information, so this will probably be the longest section in the video. Starting with a little bit of information about, this, about the ship, SS El Faro was a hybrid ship herself in a way, a combination of a roll-on, roll-off, hey, we just talked about one of those in my video on the MV Cougar Ace, and a lift-on, lift-off cargo ship. She was built in 1975, ordered in 1973, laid down in April 1974, and launched in November 1974, and completed in January 1975. So she had a 40-year career before her loss. So, let's set the stage for her tragic end. 
And for that, we have to start by setting the stage for Hurricane Joaquin, the catalyst of her loss. On September 30th, 2015, Tropical Storm Joaquin became a hurricane. For the rest of that day, the storm only continued to intensify, and by October 1st, she was tracking southwest. She grew to Category 3 level intensity by 11 p.m. that night. El Faro's second mate, D. Randolph, said in an email to friends and family, quote, There is a hurricane out there, and we are heading straight into it. Now, why, you are probably asking, would El Faro sail right into a hurricane, which is only becoming more and more violent as the hours go by? Good question. El Faro's captain, Michael Davidson, planned on using El Faro's normal route and head directly to San Juan. He thought they would pass south of Hurricane Joaquin, though hurricane-level winds would be in the vessel's vicinity. Sounds all fine and dandy in theory, but you see... He misjudged the route that they needed and didn't take sufficient action to stay south of the hurricane. Shortly before the storm became a hurricane, he did decide to steer the vessel further south than she would usually go. It just didn't end up being enough, unfortunately. Ten hours after departing from Jacksonville for San Juan, El Faro attempted to avoid the hurricane, but less than a day later, the foreboding reports were heard. The U.S. Coast Guard received a satellite notification that the vessel had lost propulsion and was taking on water, though it added that for the time the flooding was contained and under control, but it had caused the ship to develop a 15-degree list to her port side. No attempts to open communication with the ship were successful, though messages from it were heard, as was a message from the ship's emergency position indicating radio beacon. One of the last positions from the ship, which was picked up, placed it within the eye wall of the hurricane. By October 2nd, a U.S. Coast Guard search had begun. Multiple types of helicopters were utilized to search the ocean and still just terrible weather. One body was found drifting during the search, but it couldn't be recovered or identified. A deflated life raft from El Faro and a heavily damaged lifeboat were also found. It was stocked with supplies, but no one was on board. By October 5th, the vessel was declared lost at sea, and MV Isabella was chosen to replace El Faro. By October 31st, a vessel was identified sitting upright on the bottom of the ocean at a depth of 15,000 feet, and it was consistent with a cargo ship. On August 5th, 2016, the ship's voyage data recorder was recovered from the wreck. In Jacksonville and San Juan, twin memorials to the ship were erected. There is an additional memorial at Rockland, Maine, where five of the deceased crew were from. That's not all, though. Since the recorder was recovered, we know a minute-by-minute -minute account of everything that happened. I'm going to read aloud some of the snippets that were recorded before the ship sank. They paint a very vivid picture, so tread lightly. Viewer discretion is advised. This is pretty harrowing because these are the final words from some of the crew before the ship sank. At 6.54 a.m., Captain Davison took a phone call describing the situation on the ship. It's miserable right now. We got all the, uh, all the wind on the starboard side here. Now a scuttle was left open or popped open or whatever, so we got some flooding down in three hold. A significant amount. Um, everyone's safe right now. We're not going to abandon ship. We're going to stay with the ship. We are in dire straits right now. Okay. I'm going to call the office and tell them. Okay. Um, there's no need to ring the general alarm yet. We're not abandoning ship. The engineers are trying to get the plant back. So we're working on it. Okay. 7.06 a.m. Davidson made another phone call. I have a marine emergency, and I would like to speak with a QI. We had a hull breach. A scuttle blew open during the storm. We have water down in three hold. We have a heavy list. We've lost the main propulsion unit. The engineers cannot get it going. Can I speak with a QI, please? We have uh, since secured the source of water coming into the vessel. Uh, 
The scuttle blew open. It's since been closed. However, uh, three holds got a considerable amount of water in it. Uh, we have a very, very healthy port list. The engineers cannot get lube oil pressure on the plant. Therefore, we've got no main engine. And let me give you um, uh, latitude and longitude. I just want to give you a heads up before I push that, push that button. The crew is safe. Right now, we're trying to save the ship now. But, uh, all available hands. We are 48 miles east of San Salvador. We are taking every measure to take the list off. By, by that, I mean pump out that pump out that hold the best we can, but we're not gaining ground at this time. Right now, it's a little hard to tell because all the wind is on that side too, so we got a good wind heel going. But it's not getting any better. 7.15 a.m. The chief comes up to the bridge to report news from below. I think that water level's rising, Captain. Okay, do you know where it's coming from? At first, the chief said something hit the main, the fire main. He got ruptured hard. Um, is there no way to secure that? We don't know if they still have any pressure on the fire main or not. Don't know where's C between the C-suction and the hull or what, uh, but anything I say is a guess. Nine minutes later, at 7.24 a.m., the situation had rapidly deteriorated. We still got reserve buoyancy and stability. Following this order, the second mate was instructed to ring the alarm and wake the crew. About a minute later, the captain can be heard shouting, quote, Bow is down! Bow is down! At this point, the order to abandon ship was given out. Get into your rafts! Throw all your rafts into the water! Get everyone off! Get off the ship! Stay together! Captain Davison spent the next several minutes trying to help a panicked helmsman get off the bridge. Meanwhile, alarms were ringing out all around them. The captain told the helmsman to, quote, Work your way up here! Remember, the ship was basically rolling over at this point. Some of the other things the captain told him were, quote, You're okay, come on, and I'm not leaving you, let's go. The helmsman kept shouting that he needed a ladder, a line, someone to help him. And at 7.39 a.m., while he and the captain were still on the bridge, the recording stops. None of El Faro's crew survived the sinking, and the ship still rests on the bottom of the ocean. So last time there was a bonus story, and why not have another one for those who watched the whole video? Today it's cheating a little because this ship didn't really disappear, we know what happened, but we're going to talk about it anyway because it's really interesting. We're going way back for this one to 1511 so we can talk about the loss of the Fleur de la Mar and her legendary cargo. I'm going to keep this short and just summarize this one. Again, it's kind of cheating. The Flor de la Mar, which means Flower of the Sea, was a Portuguese carac, a three or four masted ocean sailing ship. In 1511, Alfonso de Albuquerque, do you think he took the left turn at Albuquerque? Decided he wanted to use the flower to transport a whole lot of treasure looted from the Sultan of Malacca's palace back to Portugal. Despite the flower being called unsafe, he was not dissuaded and took her to sea and she sank. She was wrecked in a storm and crashed into shoals, eventually sinking on the 20th of November off the coast of Sumatra. Albuquerque survived using a makeshift raft, and he was rescued from the sea, but the treasure was all lost, along with more than 400 men. The flower of the sea has never been found, and neither has the treasure she was carrying. Portugal, Indonesia, and Malaysia all claim salvage rights, so if she was ever found, it would probably be a shitstorm. You gotta wonder, though, where is she? We know the general area she sank in. So why has not even a single trace of any gold or jewels ever been found? Either way, the most valuable shipwreck in history remains undiscovered on the ocean floor, one of the great enduring mysteries of the sea. Some of the oldest artifacts on Earth are early watercraft. So humans, as a collective, have been taking to the waves for maybe millions of years. 
We know that we have been drawn to the sea for that long because artifacts from extinct human species have been found on islands which were never connected to the mainland. And in all that time, sometimes, people ventured out into the ocean and never returned. The ocean is a place of more unsolved mysteries than perhaps anywhere else on Earth. Lists exist of people who vanished at sea going all the way back to the late BC era. This lovely liner was launched on October 27th of 1908 and was a late Edwardian era mail carrying passenger and cargo ship registered in Australia. From 1909 to 1912, she operated along the northwestern section of the western coast of Australia, traveling back and forth from several ports. She was the first cargo ship built exclusively for service on the western Australian coast. Her interiors were designed with multiple areas for passengers to enjoy. Many were luxuriously decorated. They were well vented and comfortable. SS Cambana could carry her passengers within her accommodations on comfortable and fun crossings up to 300 first and second saloon passengers. Her cabins even had electric fans and were also well vented. Now, similar to the SS Neuronic, which we covered in an earlier episode on this topic, Cambana had, had been designed with particular attention to the conveyance of livestock within her cargo facilities. Her main deck, foredeck, and aft deck were well equipped with special pins for transporting either 220 head of cattle or 1,500 sheep. Now, Let's get to her disappearance in 1912. On Wednesday, March 20th, 1912, Cambana left for Broome in Western Australia, being followed by the SS Ballara. There was a northeasterly wind blowing at the time. Captain Allen of the Cambana had noted that the barometer was falling, but merely thought the voyage might take longer than he expected. He and Captain Upjohn of the SS Ballara thought nothing of it, having discussed the weather, but... All too soon, the weather would become a, quote, a howling hurricane, as described in the Ballara's logbook. A few hours after departing, the two ships were struck by a massive gale. They altered course to head more to the north to escape it, but then they became separated. Ballara suffered damage from the weather, but she limped into port, delivering her passengers safely. And so Cambana, however, was never seen again. Multiple vessels had been beached, wrecked, and sank in the storm, and the cyclone caused damage along 200 kilometers of coast. A search for the ship only turned up a piece of a starboard bow planking of a motor launch, a stateroom door, and a panel from the promenade deck, along with some air tanks and two planks for covering tanks of lifeboats. Other than the air tanks, everything was found at sea. A popular theory to explain Cambana's loss is that she capsized in the stormy seas, some agreed, claiming the vessel was top-heavy, though her inaugural chief engineer disputed this. No definitive answer has ever been given, and the wreck of the cabana is still missing. Until it is found, and she can tell us what happened. As even after all this time, she would still bear the clues of what caused her loss, we can only speculate. A few anomalies have been located on the ocean floor in the area she likely vanished in, but to this day, the wreck has never been found. This is an example of a ship which we know what happened to, but what remains missing is her wreck. The Hans Hentoff was the last ship to sink with the loss of life due to striking an iceberg. The story has some very interesting parallels to the loss of the Titanic in 1912, but the two should not be compared. Hans Hentoff's story should be looked at on its own and not compared to the more famous Titanic. They were both their own tragedies, but the parallels are striking. They say history repeats itself, and in this case, it definitely did. Like the Titanic, Hans Hentoff was thought to be the safest ship afloat, and some even thought she'd be unsinkable. We've heard that before. They said the same thing about the Waratah, too. We really, really have to stop calling ships that. Also like the Titanic, the Hans Hentoff was lost on her maiden voyage after striking an iceberg. Again, these two stories should not be compared. Both were their own tragedies. I'm just pointing out some of the parallels between them. They're just really interesting. Now, let's cover the story of the Hans Hentoff. In January 1959, she left Copenhagen, Denmark on her maiden voyage. She was named after a Danish prime minister who had died in 1955. 
The Danish Ministry of Defense had also installed three 40mm anti-aircraft guns on the Hans Hentoff to be used in the events of a war, though it was decided that these would be removed upon her return. Her radio call sign was OXKA. Her hull was also riveted, which was criticized as this was known to be more vulnerable due to ice compared to other modern hull designs. And if you're a ship operating in the North Atlantic Ocean, you are going to encounter ice. It's unavoidable. Hans Hental finished the first leg of her maiden voyage in record time, arriving in Greenland, where she took on a cargo of literal tons of parish registers from parishes of Greenland. These were going to be placed within archives in Denmark upon Hans Hentoff's return. She left for the return leg of her maiden voyage on January 25th. She had 40 crew, 55 passengers, and a cargo of frozen fish on board, along with the 3.25 tons of archives of Greenland's history and genealogy. Later the next day, a distress call was sent out. The Hans Hentoff had struck an iceberg and was sinking. She was 35 nautical miles south of Cape Farewell, which is the southernmost point of Greenland. Local time was 1356, and the collision with the iceberg occurred at approximately 59 degrees, 30 minutes north, 43 degrees, 0 minutes west. The SOS was answered by other ships, but due to the weather, no one could get close. The weather also kept local coast guards grounded and unable to offer support from the air. An hour later, another SOS reported that the engine room was flooding. A final message was sent at 1741. It said the ship was slowly going down and it requested immediate assistance. A partial message was heard at 1806 local time, but it cut out and nothing else was heard from the ship. Either at that point, she lost power or the wireless operator had to abandon his cabin. Or, heaven forbid, maybe she even capsized and sank as the message was cut off. We'll never know. No trace of the ship outside of a single life preserver, which washed ashore nine months after the sinking, has ever been found. Her wreck remains undiscovered as of April 2023. It's somewhere on the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean. None of her passengers or crew survived the sinking. The search for any survivors was called off on February 7th, 1959. And the records she went down with were a massive loss for the history of Greenland and Greenlandic genealogy. Out of all the missing ships we've covered in this series, I think this one could probably be found if anyone actually went actively looking. We know the area she sank in, so I think we could probably find her if we just took the time to look. Her wreck could probably tell us a lot too, like where the iceberg struck the ship and what kind of damage it inflicted. Did it pop rivets or did it open a gash? And until we find the wreck though, we can only guess. So we talked about this ship quite a bit in my video about the sinking of the Princess Alice, and I hinted that she had a mysterious fate. Well, now it is time for me to tell you what happened to her. Bywell Castle made her maiden voyage from London to a few ports throughout India in February 1870. She arrived in Bombay on the 16th of March 1870, after being delayed due to the steamer Brazilian running aground in the Suez Canal. Wow, well, once again, history repeats itself. Though she had good accommodations for her passengers, the ship was more built to carry cargo instead of people. She spent the next several years traveling around the Atlantic Ocean, from Africa and then to India and back to Europe. She was reboilered with new boilers in 1877. On the 3rd of September 1878, she collided with the steamship SS Princess Alice. Now, if you want to see that story, I'll link the video in the description. I'm not going to re-describe the whole thing here in case some of you have already watched it. Know, though, that the Bywell Castle was declared blameless for the collision. In May 1881, Bywell Castle discovered the passenger ship California in distress in the Atlantic Ocean. Her engines had broken down, so the Bywell Castle towed her into port at Halifax in five days, 876 nautical miles. Bywell Castle was awarded 3,000 pounds for the salvage for their efforts. In February 1883, Bywell Castle was reported missing. She had last been sighted on the 29th of January of that year on a voyage from Alexandria, Egypt to Hull, Yorkshire. She was carrying a cargo of beans and cotton. She was never seen again, and it's thought she was lost in bad weather due to being overladen. 
Her wreck has never been found, be it beached somewhere on some coast or island or on some shoal or down in deep water. Her entire crew was lost without a trace, along with the ship, and no trace of them or the ship has ever been found in the just over 140 years since she vanished. Her fate will likely remain a mystery forever, and I doubt her wreck will ever be found. Switching gears now, let's spend the rest of the video talking about some missing submarines that disappeared. There's a crazy amount of these, and these are just a few which I found interesting. U-116 was a Type XB mine-laying U-boat of Nazi Germany in World War II. She was ordered in January 1939 and laid down on July 1st of that year. She was launched on May 2nd, two years later, and commissioned under the command of Werner von Schmidt. She had four patrols in the Atlantic Ocean, beginning on April 4th, 1942, April 4th is actually the day I'm recording this, by the way, through September 1942. Her first two patrols were uneventful, but in her third, she torpedoed and sank the British ship Shaftesbury, which went under in 15 minutes. On her fourth patrol, U-116 was under the command of high-ranking individual Wilhelm Grimm. She left for the Atlantic Ocean on September 22nd, and her last radio message was sent on October 6th from the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. This reported position was 45 degrees 0 minutes north, 31 degrees 30 minutes west. She was never heard from again, and she and her crew of 56 were never seen again. This is what I found so interesting about this one. They were in the middle of the ocean and just dropped off the face of the earth. I just want to know why, but we probably never will. I don't think her wreck will ever be found unless it's just by happenstance and luck. I just really wonder, what made her disappear? It's stories like this that just really get my mind racing because it's just so mysterious. Her loss has never been explained, and it seems unlikely she was sunk by an allied ship, so what happened, and where is her wreck? I love these kinds of mysteries. Something which vanishes so utterly at sea just has a way of making your mind wander and try to create a story. If anyone has any guesses about what happened to you, 116, please tell me your theories. Sticking to submarines, this next one is another missing U-boat, U-337. She was a Type 7C U-boat. This type of U-boat has been called the workhorse of the German U-boat force, with 568 being commissioned between 1940 and 1945. The Type 7C was an effective fighting machine and was seen almost everywhere U-boats operated. Though their range was a bit limited, this, however, was made up for with their fighting capabilities. The most famous 7C U-boat was U-96 featured in the 1981 film, Das Boot. U-337 was laid down in 1941 and launched in March 1942. She was under the command of Kurt Rawiedel, who was a high-ranking lieutenant in the German Navy. The submarine was powered by two six-cylinder supercharged diesel engines, producing a total of 2,800 to 3,200 metric horsepower for use on the surface. After training, U-337 was transferred to the 6th U-Boat Flotilla for frontline service in the Atlantic Ocean. On the 24th of December 1942, the U-Boat was sailing west into the Atlantic Ocean, south of Iceland. Her final radio report was heard on January 3rd, 1943, which she gave her position as being 6 degrees north, 12 degrees west. And that's it. Just like with U-116, U-337 was never heard from again, and her loss remains a mystery. She is still classified as missing, and again, you just have to wonder what caused her loss. It's just another one of those baffling mysteries where you just have to sit and wonder what might have happened, because we have no answers. It's the same kind of feeling you get thinking about the SS Pacific, or the SS Warsaw. U-337 lies somewhere on the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean, undiscovered. Until she is, we'll never know what happened. A misconception exists where some think she was actually sunk by a British flying fortress on the 15th of January 1943 southwest of Iceland with depth charges. 
This attack was actually against U-632, though, and no damage to the sub was inflicted. On screen now is a map showing U-337's final reported position. Each installment of this series has had a bonus story at the end, and this one is no exception. Though, like with the story of the Fleur de la Mar, this one is kinda cheating, because we know what happened to this sub and where, but I thought it was an interesting story, so I wanted to tell it. We have another U-boat for this one, but unlike the others, this one's loss really isn't mysterious. What's missing is her wreck, like with the Hans Hentoff. So, it's on theme. U-388 is basically... It's 338. There's a typo in my script. U-338 basically is U-337's sister. It was also a Type 7C U-boat. She was under the command of Menfred Kinzel. She was 220 feet long, laid down on April 4th. What's again with all these April 4ths going on right now? 1941. And commissioned on June 25th, 1942. She could operate as deep as 750 feet below the ocean surface. She had three patrols and was lost on the 3rd. Here is what happened. On the 20th of September, during her third patrol, she was lost in an attack on convoy ON-202. She was spotted by a B-24 Liberator, an American heavy bomber patrol craft, and the Canadian Corvette HMCS Drumheller fired her 4-inch gun at the U-boat. U-338 dived to avoid the attack. As the Canadian ship prepared to drop depth charges on her, her crew observed a large underwater explosion. U-338 was never heard from again, and it is assumed she was destroyed by damage from the shell fire. Her wreck has never been found and lies undiscovered somewhere on the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean to this day. She sank four ships in her career and damaged a fifth. The Vitarna, or the Vigili, was a steamship owned by the A.J. Shepard and Company from Bombay. Now, unlike the Mount Temple, the ship I talked about in my last maritime video that sank with the dinosaur on board, the Vigili didn't have anything so unique to complement her story, but that doesn't mean it didn't end mysteriously. So mysteriously, in fact, that her and over 700 people who were on board and in her care were never seen again. This is their story. The SS Vitarna was laid down in 1882 and then launched in 1885. She was registered in Glasgow and was a steep hold schooner powered by steam and she was 170 feet long. She might have been on the small side, but she was a respectable ship. A proud ship. She made up for the small size by being able to comfortably carry passengers in her 25 cabins, which were spread across three floors. I imagine she was small and compact, but maybe homely and snug to travel on. Cozy, even. She was brought to Karachi, the largest city in Pakistan, by traveling around Africa for a maiden trip to Bombay. Her trips were propelled by her engines, which generated 73 horsepower, and she could also make use of sails if needed. The ship's captain was Haji Kassam, who you see on screen now. He commanded the ship as she made trade runs between the Kingdom of Kutch and Bombay. During these voyages, which took around 30 hours, she ferried passengers back and forth. So a fun weekend trip on the Vitarna might have been someone's favorite pastime way back when. And this is just a personal note, but I love steamships. They just seem proud, gliding over the ocean, well-loved, and I'd love to see one one day actually sailing, but I know they're few and far between nowadays. It's a shame that most were scrapped or now lay as shipwrecks on the ocean floor. Anyway, the SS Vitarna operated in a corner of the world where storms were common, are common, and ships would often lay up and just weather out the weather, basically. While ported at Dwarka in 1888, having just amassed a total of 703 passengers for the coming voyage, Vitarna was, according to local rumors, advised not to head out to sea due to promised bad weather. 
Modern research disputes this fact, but either way, she headed out. And due to bad weather, she didn't make a scheduled stop, and instead continued just straight for Bombay. The last confirmed sighting of her was off the coast of the port town, Mangrol. And after that, well, that's it. She never arrived at her destination, and she was never seen again. Upon not arriving at her destination, the Vatarna was declared missing. No traces of the ship, no debris, or bodies of passengers were ever found. In total, 746 people, 703 of them passengers and 43 of them crew, lost their lives when whatever befell the ship descended upon them. Among the lost were 13 wedding parties and several university students heading for Bombay. An inquiry into the incident was formed by the Bombay presidency. They pointed out that the Vatarna was poorly equipped when it came to safety measures not enough lifeboats, and not even enough life jackets for everyone on board. They proposed that she was overwhelmed by the storm and lost. Searches, which had been organized by the Bombay Presidency and the Inquiry launched to search the area of the ocean for the ship, turned up nothing. No traces of the ship have ever been found. She utterly vanished off the face of the earth. The location of her wreck is still unknown, tucked away in some never-before-seen part of the ocean floor. Now, I also want to offer up a more frightening explanation for her loss than her simply going down in bad weather. That area of the world is known for having heavy waves. What if a giant rogue wave snuck up on the ship in the bad weather and swamped her before anyone had time to even realize what happened? If a wave rolled her over suddenly... Everyone would have been trapped inside as the ship sank. It's frightening, but a possible scenario. The sacrifice of those on board was not in vain. Their story left an impact in that region, and that region of the world continues to tell their story and the lessons learned from the loss. The loss also resulted in many new bits of myths, nautical lore, and songs. It became part of that region's folklore and it's actually where the nickname Vigili comes from. Through these, the stories of those who were on board are left alive, along with the lessons you can learn from a story like this. And even today, the ship isn't entirely forgotten. A film about her was even announced in 2017, but nothing new has come from it yet. When a ship utterly disappears, like the Waratah or the Pacific, it's baffling. Especially when... Nothing ever washes up somewhere. A lot of people, though, think this can't happen today with our modern tech. Well, it can, and it does. People just disappear. Things just go missing, and it absolutely can happen again. This next story is from just under 50 years ago, and it shows that improved technology doesn't guarantee you can't go missing. Exactly, Spino. Thank you. Things can still go missing, and this story shows it. The ship in, quest in question, the MV Kirali, vanished with all hands in 1979, and she hasn't been seen since. Now, before we carry on, I'm just going to make this quick fact clear. I could not find an English video about this incident, so I apologize if that is not how you say the name of the ship. It's Forgive me if that is not how you pronounce it. I really tried to find how you say the name, and I came up dry. <laughs> Except for a questionable source. So anyway, she was a bulk carrier owned by the Kerala Shipping and Inland Navigation Corporation, an Indian company, though she was actually built in Norway. Oh, look at that. Another ship from Norway. It took us long enough to find ourselves here again. Let's see if this one fares any better than that nightmare ghost ship from the 14th century we talked about forever ago now. The bulk carrier was purchased by the Kralara Shipping Corporation after being built for 7.3 million U.S. dollars, not adjusted for inflation. Now, let's get to her disappearance. 
On her final voyage, the ship had a crew of 49 people. She was traveling to Rostock, Germany with a cargo of 20,000 tons of iron ore. The ship had left port on June 30th, 1979, and radio communications continued with the vessel throughout the 1st, 2nd, and the 3rd of July. Then nothing. The last message from the ship came through at 8 p.m. on July 3rd. Five days later, the ship didn't arrive at port as scheduled, and she was reported as missing. The following search effort for her and her crew turned up nothing. The only thing that was eventually determined in the following inquiry into the mystery was that the ship was lost somewhere around 500 kilometers off the coast of Margeo. Her loss remains a mystery, and her wreck remains undiscovered on the ocean floor to this day. Unless it's happened upon by chance, I doubt it will ever be found. This is an interesting case. The fact that she vanished so utterly is baffling. When a ship disappears, it's one thing. Usually, something will get spat out of the ocean somewhere, eventually, even a tiny piece. But when absolutely nothing does, it's just strange. This case reminds me of the Waratah for that reason. The fact the ship and her crew and all traces of them vanished like they were never there is unsettling and shows my point. Even with modern technology and improved tracking systems, things can still just go missing. Unless her wreck is found, the cause of her loss will remain a mystery, but a few explanations have been put forth to explain it. These include bad weather breaking up and sinking the ship, which can happen. There have been cases where ships break apart in literal minutes. Excess cargo overwhelming the ship is another theory. One former crew member actually said that the ship had a history of overloading herself and sailing with a cargo being unbalanced in the hold. Another explanation put forward is that the ship's cargo liquidated. Cargo liquefaction has happened before and caused ships to sink. The ship was sailing with a full belly of iron ore during peak monsoon seasons, and the theory says that the moisture might have caused the cargo to liquefy, which would have caused the ship to lose balance and capsize. More theories include faulty or simply outright broken radar. Allegedly, the radar was under repair, and the captain tried to delay sailing, only for him to be forced to commence the voyage without functioning radar. And the final theory is that the ship was attacked by pirates. Pirates are also not something of a bygone age. They still exist today, and are just as ruthless as they were in the golden age of piracy. The proposed theory is that the ship was hijacked, the crew taken to an uninhabited island and marooned there to fend for themselves while the ship was taken elsewhere or scuttled. Heck, in this scenario, the crew just being thrown overboard could be likely. If the radar was indeed faulty, then the crew would not have been able to see the pirates coming. It's an interesting idea. And if true, I hope some of the crew aren't still alive on some whatever island they were dumped on. Knowing that would just be... Horrible. Stuck on an island for almost 50 years watching your shipmates die and knowing your family has no idea what happened or that you're still out there? That's awful to think about. There's no other way to put that. Either way, we'll likely never know the truth unless the wreck of the ship is found. Until it is, her loss will remain a mystery. And once again, this story shows that even in the modern day, better technology cannot keep you from going missing. It's a humbling notion. Now then, for the next one, we're going back to the 19th century to cover another story from a time when ocean liners were completely on their own out at sea, without any way to contact anyone, and when no one would know if anything had happened until it was far too late to help. And in this case, it did. Now for an obscure one, which is all but completely forgotten. The SS's Malia was a steam-powered British cargo and passenger liner of the Anchor Line, which was a Scottish merchant shipping company that was founded in 1855 and remained active until 1980. The ship was launched on June 30th, 1870, and she was 1,630 gross registered tons and 300 feet long. 
That is a large liner for the time. This is actually around the time when ocean liners were getting larger due to an increase in not only immigration, but demand for transatlantic services. The Ismailia was built by the Robert Duncan and Company Shipyard in Port Glasgow. Glasgow was also her port of registry. She was actually en route to Glasgow when she disappeared in September 1873. She left New York on what would be her final voyage on September 30th, 1873, with 52 people on board. She was seen again on October 2nd, but never again after that. All 52 people on board were lost with the ship, and absolutely no explanation for lost exists, and the reason for the ship's disappearance remains an unexplained mystery to this day. Her wreck has never been found, and probably never will be, unless, again, someone just happens upon it by chance, because we have nowhere to even begin to look for her. Today, she is all but forgotten. I couldn't even find a picture or a painting depicting her, something most ships, even the forgotten ones, enjoy having at the very least. But she doesn't, and there's hardly any information about her online. She has all but disappeared from history, just like she disappeared at sea. You know, what I've really gained a perspective on with this series is just how many passenger liners have vanished with all those on board. It's a lot. Sailing on liners back then was a toss-up when it came to luck. Lots of passenger liners went missing in this general time period. The SS City of Boston, or the SS City of Limerick, for example. Before wireless communication, even sailing on luxury liners came with significant risks. And I don't think we can truly appreciate that risk today. The story of the Ismailia makes me wonder, are there any liners which have vanished? And not just at sea but from history, and have truly been forgotten today, along with their passengers? Ships which just have no records anymore to tell us they existed. I brought up the city of Limerick right there for a reason, because it's almost in that boat, no pun intended. The only records of it that remain that I could find are the dates it was built, when it vanished, and how many vanished with her. Aside from that, there's almost no details to prove that ship ever existed. It just really makes you wonder, have ships, maybe even passenger liners, vanished not just at sea, but from history itself? It's an unsettling thought. In a way, ghost ships could truly be real. Our next ship is another passenger liner from the French Fabre Line. Fabre Line was a French shipping line service that began operating a small fleet of sailing ships in the mid-1800s. and had ports of call in America, Portugal, Greece, Beirut, Naples, Italy, Egypt, and many, many other countries. The Nistria was a passenger ship, one that also has very little information left about it today. The Nistria is also another ship that I could not find a picture of. Yeah, sure, you do that, Spino. The Neustria was built in France during the mid or late 19th century. Again, there is little information about the ship, so it's hard to find accurate dates. We know, though, that she was 328 feet long and had a beam of 40 feet, as well as a compound engine accompanied by a single screw. And though we have no pictures of the ship from what I could find, we have a fairly detailed description of what she looked like, so we can at least create a mental image. She had one funnel, two masts, a straight stem, and an iron hull. She might have resembled something like this. This is the SS City of Glasgow, another ship which disappeared at sea that I talked about earlier in this series. Hey guys, a little last minute update in the editing right here. I actually took a second peek and did track down a picture of the SS Nistria, along with some additional information that Spino has nicely been spitting out. Because if he's going to keep insisting he appears in these projects, then he is going to have to start offering up some fun facts along the way instead of his quips. But anyway, this is what the ship looked like. Add some sails to those masts, and I wouldn't have been too far off with my guess about her appearance being similar to the SS City of Glasgow. 
I'll leave this on screen for the rest of the section, but I did manage to find a picture of her, and I was very thrilled. From the description I read of her, I thought, this sounds like too high profile of a ship for no pictures or paintings of to exist at all. And yeah, I was right. There is one, and you see it now. So she has a leg, or rather a screw, up on the Ismalia when it comes to that. All right, let's get back to the story. Looking at the wider picture, away from appearances, the interior of the ship contained accommodation to carry 18 first-class passengers and 1,100 steerage passengers. The ship carried passengers on the Marsali to New York City route and was used in the Spanish-American War when Spain used the SS Nistria to bring back Spanish troops from Cuba. She also brought immigrants from Italy to New York. Just like with the last ship, this one's loss remains an unexplained mystery. Her wreck has never been found, and we have no explanations for why she disappeared. If I had to guess, I'd say bad weather, maybe an iceberg, or a fire on board, or even a rogue wave could all be explanations for what was responsible for the loss. But unless her wreck is found, which could still bear the clues to tell us her story, we can only guess what her fate really was. The last time the liner was sighted before she disappeared for good was when she sailed from New York on October 27, 1908, her destination being Marseille. On the voyage, she vanished without a single trace being left for us to have a clue as to what happened. On this crossing, she wasn't carrying passengers, but she and her crew of 38 were lost. Her wreck rests somewhere on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean to this day, and the ship has become little more than an all-but-forgotten footnote in history. For that reason, I don't think anyone will ever go looking for her. She's not remembered enough for people to want to try and find her again. And again, the cause for the loss is unknown, but it could very well be one of the things I offered up a moment ago. Tell me what you think it was out of the four. I'd love to know your theories. Let's have a look at a ship that is more widely known about and has more information about it, way more than the last two, which is great. But it is also still relatively obscure compared to other, more famous missing ships. It's kind of a middleman, or ship. The SS Canastota, a British-flagged, coal-burning, two-masted, steel-screw cargo steamer built back in 1907 in Glasgow. Try saying that five times fast. She weighed... 4,904 gross register tons, was just over 400 feet long, and had a beam of just over 50 feet wide, and could travel at a speed of 11.5 knots on average. Since there is more information about the history of this ship, let's talk a little bit about her service before she disappeared in 1921. The ship was launched in 1907 and exchanged owners throughout the following years until 1915, when she was renamed to the SS Canastota, she had originally been built under the name Falls of Orkey. While under that original name, she made voyages to Norfolk, Virginia, and Uckland in 1908, and was chartered to carry coal to the west coast of the United States from Newcastle. During one of those coal runs in 1908, when the ship was ferrying coal from Newcastle or the Philippines, one of the crew came down with smallpox. The ship was sent to Sydney and the crew admitted to the North Head Quarantine Station and another relief crew took the ship back to Newcastle to be loaded. Once the original crew recovered, the ship returned to Sydney and they took over command once again. After being sold and renamed to the Canastota, the ship made good use of the new Panama Canal and made runs from the east coast of the United States down to New Zealand and Australia. From 1919 to 1921, the SS Canastota made service runs from the ports of New York and Boston, then down to Australian ports and back again via the Panama Canal. Now then, let's talk about the ship's last voyage. The Canastota arrived at port in Cairns, Australia on the 24th of April, 1921. She then maneuvered around to various Australian ports, including Townsville, Kings Wharf, and the Basin, before finally reaching Sydney 
on June 3rd. After a brief delay, the SS Canastota left port on June 13th, 1921, and her destination was Wellington, New Zealand. She never arrived, and the ship was never seen again. No one among the 49 people on board were ever heard from again. The only trace of the ship to ever wash up from the ocean was Floatsome. My own opinion is that the ship has become a total loss through an explosion of her benzene cargo. If that is so, the crew may be in the open boats in mid-ocean. This is what one of the relatives of one of the ship's engineers said following the disappearance. Very similarly to when the Waratah disappeared, at first, people were hopeful that the ship had broken down due to mechanical problems and was adrift. The ship did have a wireless set, but it was faulty and had limited range. People were still worried over the lack of wireless communication from the ship though, despite that. Not to mention that, if the ship experienced whatever happened to her unexpectedly, maybe no one had the chance to use the set to call for help. The father of the ship's captain said that his son promised to send him a message by a certain date, either late June 14th or early June 15th, but it never came. I don't know what's worse, the ship experiencing whatever happened to her so quickly that there was no time to call for help, or that there was, and she did, maybe for hours, but no one was close enough to hear her call. Now considering those dates, when she left and when promised communications never arrived, seems to indicate that whatever happened, well, happened very quickly after she left port for the last time. There's not a big window of time we're working with in this case, like in some others that we've talked about. Following the disappearance, there were extensive searches. People were looking everywhere, and this was a search on a scale like the one that happened after the Waratah disappeared. The aftermath of this ship going missing, and then the fallout that happened after that, could honestly make a whole video. There is so much that happened, I don't think I could do it justice unless I made a whole video dedicated to it. If you guys want a The Search for the SS Canastota video, let me know. I need a whole one to cover everything and do the aftermath of it all justice. I can't just summarize the rest of the story here and get through it as well as it should be told. So if you want that video, tell me in a comment and consider this a little teaser for it. But what you need to know to wrap up the story in this video is that the wreck has never been found, and the ship remains listed as missing to this day over a century later. Even at the time, she was quickly forgotten, and today is very obscure and little remembered. There are no memorials to her or her crew, and the cause for their loss is still unknown to this day. Though the cargo she was carrying was volatile, and it seems likely she either suffered an explosion or had a fire break out on board, which caused her to sink. I always include a bonus story at the end of videos in this series. It's become tradition for this series to include an extra story that is kind of on theme with the others, but also kind of cheating a little bit. Usually in these we have more concrete answers or we know what happened, but today is no exception. And since we're talking about a vessel that mysteriously vanished, it is only appropriate we talk about one named after a mysterious place, HMS Stonehenge. HMS Stonehenge was an S-Class submarine for the Royal Navy in World War II. She was ordered in August 1941 and laid down the next year in April 1942 and then finally launched the next year in March 1943. Her beam was 24 feet rounded up and her length was 217 feet. It should be obvious, but the submarine's name was taken from the prehistoric stone monument, Stonehenge. After training was complete, the sub departed for her, first, for her first patrol off Norway. Two weeks later, her first patrol ended without any ships having been sighted. In March 1944, after traveling down to Sri Lanka, she left for her second patrol, and four days into it, she fired two torpedoes at and then sank the Japanese merchant ship Koro Maru No. 2 with her deck gun. 
few days later, she then sank the Japanese mine layer Chokomaru. After this, there were no other incidents, and her patrol ended on February 18th. A week later, on February 25th, Stonehenge left port to patrol north of the Strait of Malacca. Oh no, the Strait of Malacca. She must have found the Orang Madan there. That's why she vanished. Whatever killed the Madan's crew must have got to the sub as well. Alright, Spinal, you're right. The Orang Madan had nothing to do with the sub going missing. Would be kind of cool, though. You know I love that story. Anyway... The submarine headed into the Indian Ocean afterward, and from there it was never seen again. On March 20th, she was declared overdue, and no definitive cause for her loss has ever been determined. The most likely explanation is that she hit a mine at some point on her patrol, but again, we don't know for sure. But a mine would have destroyed the sub instantly. Which is better than it sinking intact and her crew being trapped on the bottom of the ocean, alive for days. Maybe weeks, waiting for rescue that never came. Her wreck has never been found, and since we don't know where she was lost, it likely never will be unless, as I've said several times today, it's just happened upon by chance. But the ocean is big, and it's very unlikely without having any way to narrow the search radius down. But every now and then, people will happen upon shipwrecks, sometimes by accident while doing other things, so maybe. Never say never. Until then, though, the mystery will continue to be unsolved. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for today. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Tell me what your favorite was in a comment. I'd love to know. I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one, everyone, and thank you for watching.